The focus of this video is intermediate filaments. These are one of three different classes of cytoskeletal elements found in cells. These electron micrographs show us what intermediate filaments look like in longitudinal and in cross-section. They're solid unbranched filaments about 10 nanometers in diameter, and they can be distinguished from the other two cytoskeletal elements, microtubules and microfilaments, by a few characteristics. These are going to include their stability, the cell type specific expression, and their mechanical properties. And what I want to do now is walk you through those one by one, beginning with stability. What I want you to know here is that intermediate filaments are extremely stable. They can survive detergent treatment and high salt treatment. Those are things that would normally break proteins apart, denature them. And in fact, microtubules and microfilaments would depolymerize and be denatured by those kinds of treatments. Intermediate filaments may not be. We know this because intermediate filaments can survive after the cells that created them have died. And examples of this would be in feathers, the claws and the fur of this sloth, the hair on this human, the horns of the impala, the beak of this eagle, and the hooves of a cow. Each one of these is composed largely of intermediate filaments, and at least in the case of the human, the woman is probably washing her hair with a detergent on a near daily basis, and yet her hair persists for months or even years. It is important to note, though, that even though intermediate filaments are very stable, cells do have the ability to remodel the intermediate filaments in their cytoskeleton, and I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. And the second characteristic that I want to talk about is their cell type specific expression. There are a lot of different types of intermediate filaments. In humans, 70 different genes code intermediate filaments, and we can divide them into these six broad classes. Now, there are a number of different actin genes, some which are expressed only in muscle cells, and there are a number of different tubulin genes. There's alpha tubulin, beta tubulin, and gamma tubulin, and sometimes there's more than one variety of those. For example, there's a form of beta tubulin that's only expressed in nerve cells. But even if we add up all of the different types of actin and all the different types of tubulin, it'll be small compared to the diversity of intermediate filaments. Let me walk you through some of the different members of the family that are shown in this table, and I'll work from the bottom up. Phylensin and phacainin are two types of intermediate filaments that are found in the lens of the eye. These proteins are the most distantly related to the rest of the members of the intermediate filament family, and I won't talk about them in more detail. Next group I'll mention are the lamins, and this is the group that's going to be the exception to the rule that there's cell type specific expression. Because we find lamins expressed in every cell in the human body. In fact, we find lamins expressed in every cell in any metazoan animal. So everything except for the most primitive, say the sponges, every multicellular animal will have lamins in the nucleus. They form a mesh-like structure inside the nucleus it lies right under the nuclear membrane. And we can visualize that here. So this is an image from Goldberg and his colleagues. And I want you to imagine that you're standing inside the nucleus and you're looking towards the membrane. What we can see is that there are nuclear pore complexes. That's what these stringy structures are. Those are gonna be the pores that are gonna allow the cell to import and export proteins. And in these regions, there's no lamin. But the rest of the surface shows this grid-like network of fibers that are intermeshed. Those are the lamins. Presumably what they're doing is they're providing mechanical support to the nucleus. Now this also provides an example of remodeling because every time a cell goes through mitosis, it needs to break down the nuclear envelope and then reform it in the two daughter cells. And this will involve breaking down intermediate filaments. What happens here is the lamin proteins are phosphorylated. That causes them to depolymerize and it allows the cell to reconstruct the intermediate filament cytoskeleton after the process of separating the chromosomes has been accomplished. So leaving aside the nearly ubiquitous lamins, let's turn now to some intermediate filament classes that do show tissue-specific expression. Some intermediate filaments are expressed only in cells of the nervous system. For example, there's a type of intermediate filament called neurofilaments, which are found in the axons of all of the central neurons, so the neurons in the brain and in the spinal cord. Another intermediate filament, glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP, is found in the other type of cells found in the brain, the glial cells. 
And there's yet another intermediate filament called peripherin, which is found in peripheral neurons. There's even an intermediate filament not shown in this chart called nestin, which is expressed during embryonic development. Any one cell in the nervous system will express only one type of these intermediate filaments, so that if we take a slice through the brain and stain with glial fibrillar acidic protein, we can be pretty sure that we're looking at a glial cell, and if we see a neurofilament, we can be certain that we're looking at a neuron. That's what I mean by tissue-specific expression. Another group of intermediate filaments are expressed in skeletal muscle cells. Desmin, cinnamon, syncoilin are all found in muscles. And yet another type of intermediate filament, vimentin, is found in connective tissue cells. So the fibroblasts that secrete collagen, the blood cells, and then endothelial cells, like the ones that line blood vessels, those express vimentin. By far the biggest class of intermediate filaments, though, are the keratins, type 1 and 2. We know more about keratins than we do about any other of the intermediate filaments, and studies on keratin have informed a lot of our understanding about how intermediate filaments are assembled and how they work. Keratins are a very big family. So there are 28 of type 1, those are called the acidic keratins, and there are 26 of the type 2 or basic keratins in the human genome. We can broadly divide them into epithelial keratins and then what I'll call hair keratins. Trichocytes are a special form of epithelial cell that's involved in humans and doing things like secreting our fingernails and our hair, and those express a distinct set of keratin from the epithelial cells that are making up our skin or lining our digestive tract. Epithelial cells, and in this I'm including the trichocytes, always express at least one acidic and one basic keratin. But different tissues expect different combinations. So for example, the epithelial cells that are lining the bile ducts, which are pretty protected and don't see a great deal of mechanical stress, express K8 and K18, one acidic and one basic. Skin epidermal cells will express K5 and K14, but then also add in K1 and K10. And hair expresses 17 different keratins. There's a general rule that the harder the structure, the more different types of keratins are being expressed. And that gives us a clue to the function of these intermediate filaments, which will be to withstand mechanical forces. Most of what we know about intermediate filament structure and assembly comes from studies of either keratins or vimentins, and I'll walk you through how keratins are assembled here. Keratin genes encode proteins with the central rod-like alpha helical domain. I'll give you two examples here. In keratins, this rod-like domain is about 310 amino acids long, and each of the cylinders is supposed to represent an alpha helix. The amino and carboxy terminals of keratin genes are more globular and the lengths can differ. This basic structure is conserved among all of the members of the family of intermediate filament proteins. So lamins have this structure and vimentins and desmins and neurofilaments. We know the amino acid sequence for these proteins and what we've found is that the Amino acids that are abundant in this rod-like domain include glycine, which is small, alanine, which is small and nonpolar, and cysteine, which has the ability to form disulfide bonds. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. In the early 1990s, researchers were able to determine how keratins were assembled. They did this using in vitro experiments. They would take a test tube, and if they put in only an acidic keratin, no filaments would form. If they put in only a basic keratin, no filaments formed. But if they put in a mix of both basic and acidic filaments, and then collected the proteins from the solution, they found that there were filaments. And these filaments, shown here in this electromicrograph, are about 10 to 12 nanometers in diameter, consistent with what we see in cells. This has led to the model, then, that in order to get keratin assembly, what must happen is one acidic and one basic subunit must come together to form a dimer, and that those dimers are being held together by disulfide bonds between the two subunits, as well as by hydrophobic interactions, remember all those alanines, and by ionic interactions. By stopping their test tube experiments at various times after mixing them together, researchers were able to propose a stepwise model for keratin assembly. Initially, the monomers would join together to form heterodimers, those heterodimers could then join together to form tetramers. The tetramers would join end to end to end to end to make structures that are sometimes referred to as protofilaments. And then if we had 
eight of those protofilaments, so eight of those tetramers, that's what I'm showing on the far right, where each one of those cylinders would represent a protofilament. And altogether, that gives us the 10 nanometer keratin filament. The different subunits are held together by many non-covalent interactions, as well as by many intramolecular disulfide bonds, and that's what makes it very stable. But that doesn't mean that it isn't possible to remodel these structures. And we know this from what are called FRAP experiments, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. In this technique, what happens is that the researcher will, will apply a dye that will bind uniformly to the length of the protein, in this case, the intermediate filaments. That's what's shown in the pre-bleach image. And then they take a very strong laser and they burn one spot so that it completely photobleaches the proteins in that spot. They will not be able to fluoresce anymore. But if we follow this over time, what happens is gradually that dark spot fills in and what this is interpreted to mean is that the tetramers are able to insert themselves into the length of the keratin filament, placing ones that are damaged. This is a very different situation than what we see with microtubules or microfilaments, where individual subunits will be added at the ends. This picture also illustrates another difference between intermediate filaments and microtubules and microfilaments, and that's that once we get to the form of the tetramer, if you go and you look at the two ends, they look the same. So because the two dimers are added in the opposite direction, if you were to walk around and look at the tetramer, you would not be able to tell the difference between the end on the top and the end on the bottom. And what this means is that when those building blocks are incorporated into forming a larger keratin filament, the two ends look the same. Intermediate filaments lack polarity. And for this reason, they won't be appropriate for being used as highways on intracellular transport. Instead, when we think about the function of intermediate filaments, we think about their mechanical properties. The main function of intermediate filaments is structural. These pictures here show skin epithelial cells that have been stained to show the keratin network, and I want you to see how extensive it is and it spreads through the cell. The network that's formed is relatively flexible. Compared to microtubules and microfilaments, intermediate filaments can be stretched up to two times their resting length and then sort of spring back, so they have an elastic property that microtubules and microfilaments really don't. The right side of this image shows us another thing, and that's that intermediate filaments are often associated with membrane proteins, allowing them to link the cytoskeleton of one cell to another cell within a tissue as well as to linking those cells to the extracellular matrix. In this image, the keratin proteins are stained red, and the green shows us another structure called the desmosome. The role of intermediate filaments in structure has been studied in a number of different cell types, but probably none are as well understood as what we see in skin. This image here shows us a section through the skin. The very top layer, that's the stratum corneum, which is made up of a layer of dead skin cells, Lying underneath it, we've got several cells that are arranged in what's called an epidermis. There's a basal cell layer where the cells are dividing to continually regenerate new skin cells. And then the deepest part of the tissue is the dermis, where there'll be fewer cells and a lot of connective tissue. I'm going to zoom in on this part here so I can show you what the intermediate filaments look like. Well, here's a cartoon version now where we're looking at the epidermis. Take a moment to orient yourself so you can see the several different layers of cells in the epidermis. And now what I want you to notice is that each one of those cells has many keratin filaments and that they're linking the cells to one another and also to what's labeled as the basement membrane. That's a form of extracellular matrix using these structures, desmosomes shown in a cocoa color and hemidesmosomes in an even darker brown. It's possible to use electron microscopy to visualize what a single desmosome looks like, and that's what's shown in this picture here. The keratin intermediate filaments, KIFs, and the two cells are drawn close together at this structure, the desmosome. The gray indicates the two different membranes, and then there are a number of proteins, desmoglians and desmocollins and desmoplacans, that are pulling the structure in order to form the complete junction. These are very stable, and you can imagine that if you were to squish cell or pull on the cell, that this could resist the tearing forces and allow the cell to maintain its integrity. You can also probably imagine that if any one of the components making up the desmosome, whether it's the intermediate filament or one of the other proteins, was mutated, 
that it would affect the structural integrity of cells. This is what we see in a number of inherited genetic diseases, collectively called blistering skin diseases. I'm showing you some fairly gruesome images. On the left, we're seeing the feet of an infant born with EBS. I want you to notice the arrow pointing to that big fluid-filled blister. The second panel is showing us that there's an animal model for this, in which one of those keratins, in this case keratin-14, can be knocked out and animals carrying this mutation develop blisters which are absent in wild type. And then if we look at it at the level of bright field microscopy to look at the integrity of the tissue, you can see that in the K14 null, the skin is pulling off from the underlying dermis, and there are blisters, fluid-filled blisters, that are forming. There's a big contrast between the wild type image on the far left, where you can see the epidermis and the dermis being held close together. And that's showing us that in order to hold this tissue together, it's essential to have the normal copy of the keratin-14 in normal desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. Keratins aren't the only class of intermediate filaments that are linked to diseases. Mutations in other intermediate filaments are also linked to diseases, and these might affect the eye, the liver, the heart, the muscle. There's a lot of research that's done trying to develop drugs and genetic therapies to treat individuals with these inherited intermediate filament-based diseases.